Hey, everybody, we're back again in uh, the Mark Newhart Show. Today we got John Bell. That's right, John Bell, you're back again, John. What the hell? All right. And I know, you can't get that easy. That's right. And we also have Steve Hasse. All right, and that's filmmaker Steve Hasse, and along with him we have Dan Lang. Now, Dan, uh, now you're not really that short. You're just sitting down, right? Sitting down, yeah. Okay, I don't want people to think that you're that much shorter than John. <laughs> All right, and, the, and and now this is this is another one of the cemetery stories, and that's why John, uh, you know, keeps going back in. Okay, we got one today. It's called Five Pill. It's pretty damn interesting, huh, Steve? What what's goes on here now? Oh well, it's um, basically it's a play of of words with five K marathons, and I got the idea because I did have an instance where I was jogging at night and I got mugged by a group of kids and broke my kneecap. So while I was healing, I wrote this script and basically based it off my personal experience only to make it like a running man meets Saw meets Mad Max. Um, so essentially, these runners get kidnapped by by this crazy underground society who runs a game called Five Kill, which is basically they have to run with broken legs, they have to kill each other while racing, and whoever like basically gets to the finish line wins and gets to live, and the ones who don't make the finish line and they haven't been murdered yet, they're going to be murdered by, I mean, uh, that, I, mean the line, I don't really give a lot of backstory because it is a 25-minute movie, but, I mean, essentially everyone, you know, has a will to live. Very few people actually, you know, would, would you know, willingly die, right? The way the, op well, the opening scene, I show the jogger running and these group of people, like, beat the crap out of him. And they put a bag over his head and they put him in a van and he wakes up in this like this warehouse with all these other runners with broken legs and you know broken noses and everything like that so we only see how one gets kidnapped so i kind of it's kind of established that they run around stalking other runners and then they uh, you know buff them up and abduct them essentially Oh well, that's pretty crazy. Okay, so they're at the uh, they're at the starting line, <clears throat> and uh, they take off. I guess, or is there a starting line, or they just let out of a bus or whatever? I mean, and then they run. What keeps them from running like uh, somewhere else? I mean, do they, are they told what they got to reach to 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 win the race? Just the finish line, essentially. And they got to like kill and rough each other up as they're going along. Um, Essentially, what, what essentially they don't know where they are because, like I said, they put a bag over their head. And they're blinded. They just wake up in this room, so they don't know exactly where. They are. Uh, in getting your cast together, you guys are just normal guys like me. You got other jobs to do. Uh, yep. You done it get kind of crazy. Gets kind of mixed up. How do you keep everybody in order, uh, Dan? How do you do that? Who's who? Who does that? Uh, largely, it depends on the director. Um, when our small budgets, really everybody chips in. But it can be uh, can be just the director. Usually, the director has the last choice in who gets cast for what movie. Mm -hmm. um, we try to go with the best we can get, but being low budget, we tend to have to work with people who are a little inexperienced, so we have to kind of instruct them and walk them through it at the time. Yeah. Um, now, most of my actors are local. Um, I usually, I usually am on the Facebook group uh, called Michigan Actors, and I, I make a post saying, "Hey, there's a movie." being filmed, and I describe who I want, and I basically run auditions. Usually I do video auditions where they send me a video recording of their performance. But yeah, we all collaborate well together, especially on this project, and yeah, and um, as well as a few others previously in moving forward. Right. Cool, man. That's pretty cool. <laughs> you guys are tripping me out. What did you say about my dog, man? <laughs> It's a brush will not stand, man. Oh, wow. My dog don't pee on the right, but my cat pees on my wife's clothes when she's pissed off. Right, Nina? <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. What about location, man? You know, I mean, uh, how you guys, how you get everybody together, you know, so you can get, like, you know what I mean, man? In That's general or for the movie? Because uh, we don't have a location figured out yet. Um, no, that's what I'm saying, man. How are you going to do that? What are you going to do? What's up with that? Just in general, locations are one of the most difficult things we run across. You've got to basically 
charm people into letting letting them letting you use their property. Yep. Um, that yep. is that is extremely difficult, and um, sometimes we have to do rewrites in order to use the property we can get a hold of. One of my locations I got as we were actually already in the filming process, and uh, it came together the day a couple days before we actually filmed. Yeah, um, well, not well. In, in, especially what Dan said. Uh, I basically, when I was filming my first film, Seth and Tia, which we're still working on, I went to local bars, a couple local bars, talked to the owners, you know, and tell them what we're filming and and tell them what it's about. Of course, I showed them what footage we had so far just to see how sold they are. And then I get a, what do you call it, locational lease form, and I get them to sign that. They know we have the right to film there. Yeah, so do you guys use Facebook much? I mean, I use Facebook a lot. Of kids, hey, hey, while we're saying that, A to H, Shirley and Shane Dean and some of the other guys that are aspiring to do exactly what you guys need to do. So, I mean, you got to create an urgency sometimes. You guys do that. My favorite, my, what I, okay, so basically one of my favorite bands uh, called Angel Spit, the front man named Zoog, is composing for Five Kill, which is a huge deal because they've been a fan of this for 10 years. They... They're pretty well known worldwide, and Zoo, you know, he's uh, helped also been helping me crowdsource. We're very enthusiastic about the project, and he just released an album called Black Dog Bite, which people should check out on Spotify. And yeah, so like that was pretty exciting stuff, and we're working on a sizzle reel for it. Well, you gotta love the name, huh? How can you not love that name? That is so cool. But the the music now, don't you think that's kind of like key? Who do you have? Who are you looking for now? You know, John's got that composer. The other story. I got two from Angel Spit as my composer. Okay, so they're actually going to be composing the music for this specifically, or they're going to use songs that they've already used. Oh, he's doing the actual story. You, he, uh, he's starting. He, he's a, uh, he's, but he's the front man for the band. Angel Spit. He just, you know, like I said, released his first album, uh, Black Dog Bite, and he, they're pretty much well known right now. It's a huge deal. I've been a fan of this for ten years. And but you know, working with film, I've noticed that soundtracks sort of look, I've always known that soundtracks would make or break the film. I, me and John made a film, and Dan made a film, the three of us made Snuff. And we had Cog, who's our composer for that, and he pretty much set the tone of the movie. Oh, he did a great job! Yeah, it was very grindhousey and very uh, retro feel. I'm also looking really looking forward to Zook's score in Five Kill that he's enthusiastically making because he's got a very uh, cool cyberpunk sound to him. So yeah. I think between yeah. Evan and uh, Zook, we have a very good one in combination of uh, great posers for, for this film. Well, a little interesting side note about this. You first have to catch the audio before you can have it edited. One of the films we were shooting where I was operating the mic and we shot for probably two hours, and I had forgotten to turn the mic on. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. That's hilarious. So you two hours? That's almost oh, like you see, the thing, you see the thing where they, uh, they're doing something, and they look at the guy, and they go, did you get that? And he goes, oh, it screws up. I, I mean, I, I, I'll, I'll never forget when we shot a scene together for Seth and Tia when uh, they were with shooting a fight scene, and... Everything was out of focus, and we had to reshoot the whole damn thing. Uh, you know, these are the things, and it's cost. It, it's although it's funny to talk about right now. Oh my God, you know what I mean? So, right. It, it carries a lot of responsibility when you do this. Now, what I'm going to have you do is, uh, we got other ones that we're going to be talking about, but Five Kill is this okay. one right here, where we're taking and uh, and Five Kill. I would say if you classify it, it's not a horror. It's uh, it's kind of a uh, uh, how would you classify it? Is a uh, shocker? Or... I well, was five kill a shocker. Yes. What would you classify? I don't want. To, is it a horror? Is it, why is this guy doing this to these people? What can they do to get out of it? Right. Yep. Right. It's a. Um, it's basically just a really fun blood splatter fest that uh, Jason Highshutter and I co-wrote together. But forgot the drop. I can't forget the rapper's name. He. Yeah, wrote a good sure. chunk of that, and he and we got some pretty really cool like build up like when they're trying to get out of the get out they're being led by a man named Cycle Man Jack, who's helping trying to help them escape. Of course, you know there's people with batons, machetes. There's pigs. 
that eat people. There's dogs that eat people. Now, now, no, no animals were injured in the making of this movie. That's correct. We didn't make it yet, but yeah, we, 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 there won't be animals we injured. Intense. We promise we won't hurt anybody. I will get footage of us treating the animals nicely to prove to PETA that we are not abusing animals. All right, so you guys, now that's five kill, and you look for that to be start production. Uh, you're saying probably about January. January. Okay, so and. Uh, Anybody interested in either getting involved in funding or uh, being a part of it, uh, they can contact me through the Mark New Art Show at Gmail, and I'll forward them to you, of course. But you'll also have probably a crowdfunding page and so forth. Um, yeah. I'm making one, actually, with my, with my sister on any Google very soon that me and awesome. Zoog are putting together. All right. Well, cool. Now, so that's five kill. And now what I want to talk about is because you do, like, the several uh, movies at one time – I'd like for you guys to kind of tell me how each of you, uh, how do you keep it together? I mean, how, how do you not be thinking of Bear Hug when you're doing Blood Fire or uh, James uh, Brothers Retribution, the line comes up and, you, you know, how do you, how do you handle that? Oh, we use, yeah, we'll we actually use all those techniques. We, uh, we use anything that really comes to mind. If we've seen it in other movies, we like it. We kind of, kind of change it a little so there's no copyright infringement, and we use that. Yep. Most of the time, we hit the scene rolling with the story that we've written right from the get-go. And then from there, like myself, if a cast member or somebody has something creative to put in and I like it, I'll use that. Um, just other than that, organizing your props and getting everything ready to go. The movie-making business is not really that straightforward where you have a, a set schedule it really kind of comes to you as you go as you see each scene location and where you have your camera and how the people work out you can't get your ideas on the fly exactly yeah i mean like thursday i was working in a western film and two days later i was filming cemetery stories in a cemetery so one day i'm an actor one day i'm a director um uh, not too long ago, I was working in Atlanta on another film, and, and, and uh, I can't say much about it, but it was uh, as a medic. So, yeah, there, there's a lot of changes, but uh, I'll have five, six different scripts at once sometimes and just kind of go with the flow on each. Uh, know your lines for each character and know in your head, you know, your own way how to get into that character on a one-to-day-to-day -to -day basis. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I'm wondering too, uh, as you're a director and as you're, you know, producer and as you're an actor, which is the funnest thing to do in uh, in doing the movie, huh? What did you come on? I want an honest answer here from each of you. What is funnest, your part? Fun, uh, funnest I job? Love to be, but I also love being behind the camera as well. Um, I two things. Uh, well, directing's a lot of fun, but I gotta say, my favorite part of the job is probably editing. I you did. go weird with it. It really depends on, on where your passions lie. Uh, actually, I really, I'm a stunt guy. I, I really enjoy doing a lot of stunts. Um, but, yeah, it's fun to see your, you know, you're telling a story when you're when you're making a movie, and it's fun to see the story come to life. And That's... it's how you interpret it and how it how it comes onto the screen is the whole story. So that can be very rewarding, very entertaining when you do something like that. It's also fun, too, to build something up from the ground up uh, where you write it, you you audition, you cast, get the locations, you film it, um, and then get into post. And just watch that whole thing grow, man. It's pretty awesome. Exactly. And there's nothing more rewarding than seeing a script that you work so hard on and so enthusiastically come to life before your eyes. It's, it's magical when you see it on the film. It's magical when you see actors performing the characters that you wrote. We're making movies. That's exactly what we do on a regular basis. We have to sit down and sometimes we watch those those scenes three, four, or five times before we decide on what we're going to use. Same thing. Exact same thing. So in Cemetery Stories, you're going to have Blood Fire, you're going to have Five Kill, and you're also yep. going to have Bear Hug. And now I've seen some clip from Bear Hug, you sick puppy, that John Bella, I was like, Mm, how the hell do you get in that mode? Because that, that, that dude looks like he's, you know, he just looks. Oh, the dad was my favorite uh, character as far as emotionally, physically, um, being able to uh, get into that character. It, it actually came pretty naturally, which is scary, but 
I can't wait to see that. Yeah, performance. That, that's, I, a lot of people really are like, okay, that, that's not the John we know. That's exactly what I love. It's not Happy John? Right. <laughs> it's like that Jack Nicholson crazy John. <laughs> Welcome to acting. Right. Yeah. I'm about to act for the first time ever in Five Kill. We'll see how well I do there. Well, you really snuck. Yes, I did. I played a good, I played a little gimpy dog-like character in Snuff. It's true. And I, I was in an A scene of Snuff too as a cameo. Now, James Brothers Retribution, huh? <laughs> <laughs> huh? What do you think? Yeah, I can't say much about it. I was than you. <laughs> you got to remember that there. You got the the gambler in there next time. The big dogger. What the <laughs> hell is that on your neck? <laughs> That's my medicine bag. That's an actual authentic medicine bag. You know, back in the desert when I was a kid. Oh, poop or something. I, I couldn't tell. It's not poop. That'd be disgusting. No, that's my medicine I, bag. I, 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 I got that. that for, I've had that for going on 17 years now. What it is. Oh, pretty awesome. I uh, used to be a millwright out in the Iosepa in the Navajo Indians. They get freaked out when they see snakes, okay? Now, I catch snakes and scorpions with my hands. It's a little technique. So Great. they would uh, call me when they lift the pallet. Instead of mauling and beating the hell out of the snake, they'd call me. i catch the snake, put it under my jacket, take it off into the desert. Now, when I went out in the desert, you know, three, 400 yards off the site, I'd take either a little cactus, a little cactus flower or something and put in here. There's a couple of emperor or scorpion claws in here I'd show you, but it's scary to see. And then that would, like, stifle your movie. They'd be like, oh, I'd go see Cemetery, but I've seen the scorpion claws in Mark Smith's back. I don't ever want to see anything to say. But anyway, so you got you got uh, five total stories. Uh, how does how can I, it starts with uh, how how's the order go, John? Let us know. Yeah. Uh, well, here's the batting order. Um, we also have Chase uh, Murphy, who's not with us tonight. Um, he his segments are the first two diced. And then bear hug. Uh, each segment gets a little bit darker. Uh, five kills the third movie is segment. Um, I just think that having that the darkest, goriest one, as far as the more the brutality of it, is great to be like right smack in the middle of it. And then uh, dance segment peonage is fourth, um, which I think is a good segue uh, right into the blood fire segment, which is like the main event. Right. Well, it all kind of, it all ties in without getting into too much detail, but uh, Cemetery Stories basically is a couple on Halloween night. They're both clairvoyant, and when they pick up a vibe from a tombstone, they put their hands on it, and it swirls into a vision, their vision of how this person died, which is each segment, and there's stuff happening as their storyline progresses as well. Uh, and there's also this dark presence stalking them, who's slowly revealing himself as time goes on. So, uh, all that comes to a pretty cool uh, ending. Awesome. Well, we're gonna we're gonna get to these events. We got uh, this uh, five kill is gonna be uh, starting production there in January. If uh, anybody's interested, you may be looking for an actor or an actress in that movie at some point. They can contact me on Facebook. Or, Actions, yeah. Yeah, or a uh, a funding. If you want to get involved, like on Bloodfire Stories for $1,000, get yourself a producer's credit. We got a special surprise from the props category, I think, that we're working on, aren't we, John? That's right. <laughs> Same with mine. That's right. But you ain't going to get this damn Renegade, so don't get that off your mind now. Here, uh, That's another thing, wardrobe, you know. You guys have these incredible wardrobe uh, expenses, I'm sure, right? Uh, yeah. You change uh, yeah. Uh, you, an amazing prop guy. You met Dave? Um, I'm one of the interviews. Um, he's doing some prop work for Steve. James, yeah. yes, man. Yep, yes, man. Yeah. So, so props and uh, and wardrobe and all those things are important. All these things, people when they want to start off making a film, what's your suggestion to them? One positive and one negative suggestion for people starting off in the movie industry. What it, what, what what would it be, Dan? Um, you want to for a positive influence. Yeah try to pair up with as many people who know what they're doing as possible get as many people on your set there there's a, there comes a point when you kind of have to stand your ground and make them all behave but for the most part you want as many helpful hands as you can on your set 
The worst part is again probably money. We yeah. Just, we just never have enough money. Never. So you've got to kind of learn to shoot on the fly and, and make do with what you got. The positive is, well, if you really want to make a movie, you'll make a movie. Uh, the negative is, uh, again, funding. And if it's like a funding, your film's going to probably take a lot longer to finish than, say, a Hollywood production. So, yes, there's, and of course, I think the worst part is, um, I'd say scheduling, because a lot of people who are going to be involved in your production, if you're doing DIY like me, work day jobs. So you got to work around theirs. So that's probably the worst part. But the most positive part is that you're making a movie and your vision's coming to life. Yeah, that's how I feel too. Uh, the big positive is um, when you're, you're doing what you're passionate about and you've seen it come to life, um, that, that's always a big plus. And uh, I would say if there's any negative is you really got to be careful um, for scammers. Uh, if you're in, investing in a production, you want to make sure that yeah. These people are actually going to do their best to make sure that you're, they're working hard to make, make a profit for you as well as for them. And, you know, acting wise, you want to make sure that uh, you research who you're working for a little bit so that cause I've, I've worked on films where it turned out to be a waste of time where you just put countless hours, not getting paid, driving back and forth. And just, you know, the production doesn't come about, you know, it, so just do your research before you work with people a little bit. And um, you kind of can gauge people a little bit, too. You can hear about their reputations if you get to network people. Uh, and that happens over time. But uh, you got definitely got to have patience, too, in this industry. Yeah. You, yeah. It doesn't happen overnight. Right. <laughs> know, know your industry. Michigan is very small, the acting community. It's tiny. It's tiny. You're, you're dealing with a lot of the same people over and over again. We've got a, a fair amount of new people coming in, but they uh, there's a big turnover. They pretty much leave fairly quickly. The real diehards stay in place, and your reputation is everything. And if you get a bad reputation right from the start, yeah, you're not going to get many phone calls. So, uh, yeah, yeah, that's why we're putting so much hard work into this. You know, I've been to a number of screenings where these people have completed their project, but then when you see them, it's like, wow, they didn't do a very good job. And we don't want that reputation, so we're, we're yeah. working hard. We, uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> what John said. I, I mean, I hope I, I mean, I'm, hopefully everyone loves what I put, I put out there. I'm going to work hard and progress as I go along. Uh, so one of the advice I can give new filmmakers, always be respectful, always make sure that you're accommodating to them as best as possible. Never, basically just be fair with them. And to yourself. And yourself. And to yourself. And to yourself, it's important that your image get put on the film, and not somebody who wants to take over your project. And that is a big problem in this industry. Yeah, you know, very big problem. You get people on set who think it's their show and not yours. I hear about that. Thankfully, I haven't ran into that yet. Not that. <laughs> <laughs> the ascension, right? The ascension. Um, his very worst film ended up being his best song. <laughs> Just never know. Well, you think your downright shittiest work might be your, your, your gold mine. I want to let you know that John Bella is trying to do something that I think is very cool, is be known for taking care of his people. And so far, I, I can I can vouch for that. My people posted through Facebook, phone calls, texts. Well, I want people to stay up to date on our progress. I, that's one thing I'm happy about, very happy about, is the progress on this whole cemetery stories has just been very consistently moving forward. Exactly. And that's the thing is a company company is a group of people some of them are paid some of them aren't paid some of them are uh you know, trying to help you out anonymously and you don't even know they're there and having that company like i have with the austin stone players with mark force one my friends out there on facebook that i i can't even get to all of them on a daily basis like you sent me oh, a message you sent me a message about this i didn't even know i woke up from a nap i'm like oh i'm late for what you know <laughs> Because uh, cause when when I do promotions, so many messages go out and back and forth that you're buried, you know. So that's the thing I think that is the most important is is remembering that this one, that one, take a moment to say, hey, thank you for what you did as small or as big as a part as it is, you know, taking that moment to keep that company close and uh, caring. And it can be very troublesome some days. You wake up, you're like, oh, my God, everything was going great until I read this I am. I'm like, damn it. But then right. you, I was actually trying to text my 
uh, cast and crew last night to individually thank them for their work. Yeah. Um, until I ran out of time. As we go, because I thank you for being on the show. I thank you for staying late tonight, Dan. I usually uh, yeah, thank miss that. Thanks for having me. I'd love to come back sometime. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Steve. I love your hats. And, uh, you know, and thanks, John. I love your revisits. Okay. This is like the third show. We're always welcome on my show. We'll have a pleasure to be on the Mark Newhart show. Thank you so much for having us. Yeah. Thank you. Group hug. Here we go. Oh, group hug. All right. Okay. So you guys have a good night. <laughs> Ah. <laughs> nice. All right. You guys take care tonight. And we're going to go into this clip right here from Bear Hug. Okay. Now, that's not five kill, but this is Bear Hug. Just kind of tell you what you're going to look forward to. Five kill. Because if you would take me hunting this year. I said no. It's bad enough that your mother dropped you off this weekend on her time. Well, this is my time, and you are not a part of it. These animals, they hear and smell everything. They can see the slightest of movements, and feel the deepest of breaths. Now, I'm gonna leave you out here for the rest of the night. If you so much as move just one inch, I'll never take you hunting again. Do you understand? Good. I'll see you in the morning. Give you a deal like they did me, but you can come in here and see like I did Papa John, all right? It's the best. It's the best. I tell you, it's worth the drive. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. Cemetery style. Santa's helper is doing Jingle Bell Rock. Thank you.